Now, I did a countdown a long time ago called the Top 11 Naughtiest Animaniac Moments, and to this day it continues to be the most viewed Nostalgia Critic video. And looking over these jokes again, I gotta say, how did you get away with half of these risque jokes? I mean, they're just unbelievable. You know, I don't know. I don't know how we got away with them. I don't know! <laughs> I have no idea how. A lot of it is uh, benign neglect. I, I, I did see that segment of the Nostalgia Critic, and I love it. The one uh, from, um, it's on the boat, it's uh, something about finding fingerprints. I found prints! No, 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 fingerprints. I don't think so. I mean, we, we obviously, we put that in, and we, now, we just said, oh, let, let, the, let the, uh, the censor have a laugh and call us. And I guess the censor was away that week, because... That's still in there. It's amazing. Probably one of my favorite exchanges where, you know, Yakko sings all the, all the planets. Travel on to Neptune, that's a gassy freezing ball. And cold and tiny Pluto, it's the furthest one of all. There you go. That's our solar system. You forgot Uranus. Good night, everybody. I think I put that in as a joke and uh, expecting Tom or someone in authority with good taste to cut it out, and they never did. So, but then again... You know, Tom wrote Lake Titicaca. Let me sing that for you. Lake Titicaca, oh, oh Lake Titicaca, why do I sing of its fame? Lake Titicaca, yes, Lake Titicaca, because I really like saying its name. Titicaca! Thank you. It was all double entendre, so it, it, was, uh, it was more naughty than anything, I think. You know, we weren't being, we were trying not to be really mean, but we were being, uh, sort of naughty. You know, you couldn't do it today, but, uh, but we did it then. The, our gatekeeper, our gatekeeper was pretty much as twisted as we were, so I think that's the problem. You should be ashamed of yourself for even thinking it. Now, something I hear writers do a lot, especially on kids' shows, to get around the censors, is that they'll have a joke that's a little risque and they think the censors are going to pull off, so they put in an even bigger joke, something really shocking and really risque to distract from the smaller risque joke. Did you guys ever do anything like that? That's exactly right, and, and so you fight like mad for this really outrageous thing that you know should never be in there. You fight, fight, fight for that so that when the other thing, uh, uh, they, they're so exhausted, they say, okay, you can have the other thing. You guys pretty much satirized, well, everything. You did movies, you did shows, you did music videos, people. Did anyone ever get upset at the jokes you made? Tim Robbins? Really? We had won the Emmy, the daytime Emmy, and we were coming out and there, and Tim Robbins was escorting Mr. Rogers onto the stage, and as he passed us, we were walking, he said, I love you, I love Animaniacs, but please don't, please don't ever put me in your cartoon, don't, don't make fun of me. And uh, I said, I'm sorry, I think we've already done it. <laughs> I think Country Joe of Country Joe and the Fish called. We did a Woodstock Slappy. He was uh, upset about uh, some something we had parodied in there. And it's 8, 10, 12, I'm just killing time. My contract says to sing a song. Yeah, I made a rhyme. That doesn't sound like a parody. That sounds like my song. I think that um, Stephen showed Martin Scorsese the, the good feathers, um, and he really thought it was funny. We got a little close to Richard Lewis's material in Noah's Ark cartoon. So I think Richard Lewis's manager said, you know, could you... Try not to steal all of his material next time. And we said, okay. Look, I don't know who you think I am, and I wish I cared, but I don't. Get on the boat. It was an homage, Richard. No, no, nobody really, we never heard from anybody. But maybe because of this, they will, and they're going to come after us. So thanks a lot. Yes, well, I live to destroy careers. Shoot me. With that said, Sherry, as people may or may not know, you were the live-action reference for Ariel from The Little Mermaid and Belle from Beauty and the Beast. And something I've noticed is that there's a lot of Disney-related jokes in Animaniacs, particularly in the Slappy the Squirrel cartoons. Bumby the dearest dear. That junk's rotting out your brain. No wonder you like that bonkers show. I even recall one where you blow up, run over, and smash Pluto the dog. Um, bad memories or just an easy target? Certainly not bad memories. No, no, no. That was uh, a lot of fun.
doing the mermaid and bell no uh probably an easy target i mean slappy though um made fun of not made fun of but she knew everybody in show business so everybody was fair game you know hannah barbera characters got slapped around a lot by her too she used to date george jetson of course, Steven Spielberg produced both this show and Tiny Toons, which were both gigantic hits. Uh, how involved was he in the process? Because fr from the look of things, it looks like he was a pretty damn good producer. Great. I mean, he was uh, involved in the fact that, you know, he was making at the time, I think, Jurassic Park and Schindler's List and, and whatever, and then he'd be faxing us notes on uh, these little animated scripts we'd write, but uh, mostly he was interested in it being uh, funny and having a different look and a feel and everything else like that. He read um, every script. What I remember about him was that you would give him a, you know, deliver a half hour script maybe at like two o'clock. And by 5 o'clock, he would be calling with notes. He was very fast. The turnaround with him was very fast. Now, um, sometimes, of course, he'd be busy, really busy making a movie or something. I have a photo of him uh, on the set at Schindler's List looking at like a Pinky in the Brain storyboard. So, I was there maybe you know, two months or something, and I, I had written a little bit, and I got a memo from Stephen. I think it said, I really liked what you wrote. I think tears began to well in my eyes, and I immediately called my wife at work, and I, and I read her the memo, and look what it said. And then I, I think I ran throughout the studio. I got a flashlight, and I let everyone read the memo. So there was an episode in Freakazoid. It's Freakazoid, and then all of a sudden, Wacko comes in, and then Pink and the Brain come in. And there's this whole exchange about what show Stephen likes, likes best. Well, Stephen likes us best because we got a memo, and that's the memo I was talking about. If I'm not mistaken, Freakazoid is Stephen's favorite show. We got a memo. And I have the memo still. It's in a safe. I don't let anyone look at it, but it was it was very, very nice. Uh, I can't complain. I'm one of the few people in the world that actually framed a Twitter from Roger Ebert. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd be lying if I said I didn't get excited about stupid stuff like that, too. The beautiful thing was he, when, when people did come after us or censors or, you know, he, he basically would step in and ask others to, like, back off. These guys are doing a good job. You know, they're making the show I want. So uh, it was it was fabulous. People ask me, like they ask everyone when they're kids, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so I said I wanted to be Steven Spielberg when I grew up. My parents did a really amazing thing, and they got me a chance to meet him after this big rap party. He just asked me what were my favorite dinosaurs and what were my favorite movies, and at, I remember just telling him these are the best dinosaurs there are, and, and these are the best movies, and you should make movies with these dinosaurs, and uh, God, it's so embarrassing. But it was really amazing that he listened to me. Like, I could see that on the words I was telling him, like, really sunk in. Nate, you were a little kid, obviously, when you did the voice of Skippy Squirrel. Uh, did people recognize you? And if they did, did you keep it low-key, or did you try to soak up the attention? At first, no one really did recognize me. That's the great part of being in an animated series. You can do all this hard work. You have this other secret identity. Um, but I got interviewed for uh, Sports Illustrated for Kids. They're just going to do a short interview and uh, take a few photos, and it turned into this like three or four pr uh, page spread about me as a voice actor. And uh, after that, the secret was out, and it was hard to like. I wasn't a celebrity though. It was it was very low key, but it was the worst kind of celebrity for me at that age. I was turning 13. I was trying to appear very masculine and suave to the ladies, but they all thought of me as this cuddly, woodly, fuzzy little squirrel. And uh, that did not help me with the ladies for quite a while. Yeah. It's hard being a squirrel. Now, when I watch these cartoons, I really get a feeling of the original Looney Tunes. Even more than Tiny Tunes, which was literally mimicking the original Looney Tunes. But something about Animaniacs just seemed to have the same creative energy, uh, the same need to hit both the adult audience as well as the children audience. Did they play a big part when writing this? And if not, who did? We weren't consciously thinking about the old Looney Tunes, you know, saying, let's do um, this thing like Bugs did. But um, it certainly had to be in the, in the, in our consciousness. Template, I think, we, we used originally were the Marx Brothers. Uh, you know, that sort of chaos that they orchestrated in their films. Most of the artists and, uh, you know, certainly the writers were very much influenced by the Looney Tunes cartoons. I think if you take Marx Brothers and Looney Tunes and smash them together, I think you get Animaniacs. They were so masterful that it was something to aspire to. 
I don't think they've been surpassed, certainly. I, to me, I'm still in awe whenever I see the old Warner Brothers cartoons, you know? For me, Daffy Duck is pretty much the most perfect cartoon character of all time. And that was a big influence. I would know nothing about him being an influence. What, what sort of maybe I learned from Looney Tunes was it's all about character. And if you have a great character, you can write a billion episodes. And I think that's what Looney Tunes was, 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 was all about. Rather than sort of necessarily this happens, then this happens, then, then, then this happens, the Looney Tunes were like, yeah, Daffy's on a cruise ship. What can happen? All the cultural major events of our lives, I think uh, everything we had gone through uh, up to the point where we were working on Animaniacs it was fair game as far as we were concerned. Any kind of um, inspired silliness, anything that um, was just fun for fun's sake would factor in. You know, Ernie Kovacs, uh, that sort of weird stuff. I was a big fan of uh, Monty Python and uh, Jonathan Winters. There were a few Abbott and Costello movies that I, I virtually had memorized. Go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Tell me the name of the band on stage. Who? The name of the band. Who? The band on stage. Who? One of my favorite memories working with Sherry Stoner was doing the, uh, the Woodstock episode uh, with the... Uh, What's the name of the uh, band on stage bit? We spent a lot of time together uh, in the booth so we could get the, the timing just right. Who? The name of the group. Who? The group on stage. Who? The band. No, the band is performing later. And then the Jerry Lewis thing for me was just, I was raised in Vegas. I was eight, eight years old and, and I would see Jerry Lewis's name on the, on the marquee and uh, uh, I just thought he was the funniest guy in the world. Paul, you have a character simply called Mr. Director, who you also do the voice for, and he is obviously a big influence of Jerry Lewis. You kids are gonna be in my movie. Movie? Who are you just looking at? The people watching on TV. Peoples? What peoples? Hello, nice people in the TV! I'm wondering, has he ever seen any of those cartoons? I, you know what, I have no idea. Although, when I was at Disney and I was doing a show for them, a while back, I tried to get Jerry Lewis to actually do a, a, a bit on it, and he said no, and I don't know whether it's because they said, oh, Paul Ruggs, the guy that used to do you. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I actually remember there was a tribute on Comedy Central for Jerry Lewis, and one of the clips they showed was Mr. Director acting as Indiana Jones, so chances are he did see one of those cartoons at some point. Okay, good, good. See? And most likely knew who you were and totally snubbed you. All right, well, there, there you go. Uh, well. Um, Sherry, am I right that you were originally brought into Tiny Toons to mainly write for the Babs Bunny character? Yeah. Since that is the case, and you also invented Slappy Squirrel, uh, what I really like about your writing is... Uh, we have another reviewer called the Nostalgia Chick, and she has a term called the Smurfette Principle. And this is about how a children's show wants to be gender neutral by throwing in a token chick, pretty much. And it's almost a cliche to say men can't write for women, but most of these female leads were written as females first before they were written as actual characters. And I can say, growing up with uh, Bab, Slappy, Dot, uh, I always saw them as characters first before I saw them as females. And I guess what I'm wondering is, was there ever a conscious effort to fight how females were being written in anime shows at that time, or was this just how you saw the characters? I was never really um, into girly girl characters when um, I was young. I remember liking Groucho Marx and Harpo Marx. I, I liked Bugs Bunny the best out of the Warner Brothers. I liked uh, Gomez on the Adams Family. I always liked the funny one, you know? And so uh, I was never into princesses or any of that kind of thing. So it didn't really factor in um, for me to write from that perspective for Babs or any of the girl characters that I wrote for because it wasn't um, how I looked at the world. And no one ever said, oh, you know, let's bring in girl issues for Babs or for Dot or for anyone. And I don't think I would have, um, first of all, known. In fact, I know I wouldn't have known how to do that very well because I don't look at the world that way. I didn't try to make Babs one of the fellas or I didn't try to make Dot one of the fellas. Certainly not Dot because, um, I mean, there's a lot of fun to be had with her playing up or her girlish charms that she knows. Or at least she thinks she knows what she's got. No, I, 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 I wasn't conscious. It was just uh, the way I sort of approach things.
Let's talk about the animation. The animation was always great, but it did seem to have a lot of variations. The style would change very often. Sometimes it would be very solid, other times it would be very bouncy, sometimes it was subtle, sometimes it was exaggerated. Uh, how did that work? Was there different animation groups? Did it depend on the director? Like five different different companies um, that, that would, you know, be farmed out a certain short. We were employing most of Asia at the time. Uh, we had studios set up all over uh, Korea and Japan, uh, New Zealand at one point. There was a company called TMS. There was a company called Wang. Like Acom, I think, in uh, Japan was one of the top studios. Whatever you sent there always came back looking great. I could see that like Wang had a style of drawing the Warners that was a little bit more roundy. Acom was a little bit more, you know, a angular and stuff. So yeah, each company had its own way of doing it. And then other studios, it would depend on uh, you know what they were uh, what they were up against. You wouldn't always get their best crew. You know we'd get it back, and and it would literally look like you know Yakko's eyes were melting off his face, and you'd be like, oh, we're in trouble. Certain ones came back so hashed, you know, you couldn't save them in editing. You had to try and make them into something else. There would be a de detailed storyboard about exactly what would happen. Then the timing person would come in and say, okay, the gag from Yakko to go from this position to this position is so many frames. These days, there isn't as much control. You sort of just, you know, show me a storyboard and you ship it over and you kiss it goodbye and and hope nobody looks really gross. Now let's talk about one of the biggest factors on the show, the music particularly the songs. We all know Richard Stone did incredible scores and incredible music, but with every episode there had to be a minimum of like two to five songs in an episode, uh, many of them using public domain music or satirizing famous musicals. How did writing songs for the show work? Did the writers come up with it? Did the musicians come up with it? Was it sort of both? We had you know, done a lot of music in improv, and so we were used to throwing it into, uh, you know, into sketches. I think for me, what, what really got me interested in including more music was that uh, it paid residuals. When we all found out we would get extra money for writing songs, we wrote a lot of songs. No. For a while, I, everything I wrote was a light opera. We had so, so many great music composers, uh, people scoring the show. Richard Stone and, and the Bernsteins. Sometimes uh, we would throw them some lyrics that they would also have to like uh, turn into little jingles and everything. You would write the lyrics first. And then it was up to Richard Stone to um, find a way to make it sound like the original, but not so much that we'd get sued. What can I say? I love the lyrics. And the musicians were great. They knew exactly how to craft the songs, you know, to stay within the legal limits at the time. Anybody could do it. Everybody did it. Everybody. I can't think of anybody that didn't write at least some songs. Our legal guy, uh, we had one legal guy who'd stop by uh, once every two years. He goes, yeah, yeah, you guys are doing fine, you know, you're, you're staying off the, you know, you're not getting us any uh, letters from lawyers. So yeah, they were, they were masters, uh, you know, Richard Stone and the, uh, our other composers were masters at keeping it, you know, just one side of uh, a phone call. If I were a rich man, If I were the gut pigeon, cooey, 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 fettuccine, cream sauce, parmesan. Then we had a guy like Randy Rogel who, who comes in, and he was working on Batman, and he said, Hey, Tom, he walked up one day and said, You know, I got this little song, I, I wrote it a year ago, and... It, it wasn't particularly written for Animaniacs, but I said, I think it would be cool for your show. And so he played it, and everybody that heard it said, yeah, we should we should have Yakko. We have Rob Paulson sing this and put it in the show. It really didn't have anything to do with any other part of the show, but it was uh, turned into Yakko's world. United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too. Talk about uh, hits on the internet. I mean, people remember the show for, for this song. Bolivia, then Argentina, and Ecuador, Chile, Brazil, Costa Rica. So once we had Rogel aboard, uh, we said, hey, yeah, Randy, you, you can stay. <laughs> And then Rob Paulson, who was so amazing, is so, so amazing, that he could deliver on a song like that, right? I mean, I've seen him do it live. I can't even believe it. He's amazing. Costa Rica, Belize, Nicaragua, Bermuda, Bahamas, Tobago, San Juan, Paraguay, Uruguay, Suriname, and French Guiana, Barbados, and Guam. I actually tried memorizing that song when I was a kid. Um, I, I don't recall doing very well. I think I got up to Canada. But, yeah, it, it's a obviously a very well-written song. My son took the um, AP history test, and he said kids in the class were singing the president's song before the test. 
So I thought that was pretty funny. John Tyler, he liked country folk. And after him came President Folk. Zachary Taylor liked to smoke. His breath killed friends whenever he spoke. Then it became once he, we saw how, or Tom saw how successful he was at the first one. Then it just became, well, let's let Randy, you know, name all the planets. Let's him, you know, name all the molecules and I don't know what I'm saying, but you know what I mean? So then we were literally, we, we would literally throw Randy uh, a song idea. Like, how about like, you know... You ever been stoned, Randy? I don't think Randy has ever been stoned, but you know, when you contemplate the universe, Randy, you know, like, like the whole universe could be on the head of a pen, you know, and uh, so then he tur he wrote Yakko's Universe, which I, I think is uh, just a beautiful song. Cause there's a hundred billion galaxies that stretch across the sky, filled with constellations, planets, moons, and stars, and still the universe extends to a place that never ends, which is maybe just inside a little jar. He really took it to the next level um, about, you know, what a song for Animaniacs is, is going to be. And then Deanna, I think she did a whole Good Feathers parody um, that was all singing and stuff. Um, that was not my, I couldn't even, oh, that just made my head hurt. With Lame as Her Animal, that was um, Deanna Oliver who did that. And uh, she was very familiar with the musical, obviously. Master of the house, dialing out the charm, ready with an handshake and an open Bitten in the butt, gardener for terror, took a little nibble from the dairy air. Now, how on earth did you guys get Bernadette Peters? Because that wasn't just a walk-on cameo, that was one of the main characters. She was in the opening credits, and she's pretty much a goddess of Broadway. I mean, she was huge. I think, I, I honestly, I mean, I think Steven Spielberg's name carries a lot of clout. Andre Romano and Tom Ruger sort of had talked about it and said, you know, she would be great. Um, boy, if only we could get her. And then everyone's like, ah, Steven. I know that Andrea Romano was um, putting it out there to a lot of singers first. And um, somehow she got through to Bernadette Peters' people and uh, she said yes, which was amazing. At the end of the road is a city of light, the city of romance. We'll be drinking merry and dance. And with any luck at all of our children tonight. We were very lucky to, to get her. We would have to like sort of work around her schedule. She would come out once every uh, month and maybe we'd do two or three of her cartoons then. And so she would have to sing, learn and sing. There were at least two songs per, per cartoon. Some of them are like ballads and big, big whopping songs. There is a flat in Gay Paris, safe on a tree lined avenue. She's a performer. She didn't want to do these things like that. I mean, she needed to, like, hone them. And then what a treat to actually go into a recording session and actually get to hear her sing in person, because it's just astonishing. Out here in the shadows and out here is a promised land out here. And, you know, some of the performances are almost like, oh, they're almost touching, haunting, you know. This place, our home. 